Hello, fellow dorks. It's me, your boy, True Sight. But today we're going to talk about False Sight. In addition to being a former professional dungeon master and game master at a number of venues, I am also a professional idiot who has made a ton of cringe mistakes over the years as a dungeon master. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun, in between me giving all of my very, very serious advice about dungeon mastering, what with consent and emotions and all that jazz, what if I told you about some of my worst mistakes? A lot of these don't really come up to the level of a D&D horror story, the kinds that I want to prevent by starting this channel and helping other DMs. But I hope you'll find them entertaining, and because even on an April Fool's Day, which, by the way, I was lazy and didn't do this yesterday, so it's out today, even on a funny video, I don't want to give in to just total negativity. I will be capping off each one of these fail tales with a moral of the story so that we can still learn from them. I think that's about all I have to say. Let's get to the false sight. By the way, I'm going to use this little sand timer to try to cap myself on time so I don't rant too long. When I first started as a Pathfinder game master, I had a very One Piece inspired world. We were island hopping. I basically told like all my friends, hey, whoever wants to come play and try out this new game, come out with me. And everyone came out. I was like a seven or eight person party. It was ridiculous. But anyway, at one point, they go to an island uh, that is ruled over by the Moose Lord Waldorf, just awful. Um, and somebody had made the character that we'll call Wibbly. Uh, and he was the firework gnome. He was a rogue and the player who we'll call Eugene had gone through the SRD and bought like five of every firework. So when he is traipsing around at the front of the party looking for traps and things, he finds a fire trap, steps on it, and then I say, ha-ha, your fireworks blew up. So he is rocketed onto the ceiling, takes damage, falls down, takes damage. He is now dying. And nobody in the seven-person rest of the party knows how to save him. So Whipley dies. The moral of the story is if somebody finds something fun in their character creation, you know, don't, <laughs> don't use that to then punish them and kill them. And also, don't use, you know, the fact that you haven't taught everyone how to save people from dying in the game uh, to kill this person and then be like, well, it's it's y'all's fault, really, that I blew up your fireworks and then sat silently smiling as, as you died slowly. So when I first started playing 5th edition, a uh, buddy was like, hey, I just got this cool player's handbook. Uh, you know, it's 2015. Let, let's try out 5th edition D&D. My first character that I made was a wood elf barbarian named Grifico. And I decided that he should look like Antonio Banderas because I really liked Desperado and some of those movies like that. Uh, but I also decided he should sound like Antonio Banderas, and and if you will notice, like, my extreme paleness, this is not a voice that I should ever be doing, and unfortunately, as we started playing that session, I, uh, I kept going with it. Yeah, this, this is not, this is a less funny one, this is, like, actually cringe. There's a part in Adventure Zone where, uh, where Justin is playing Taco and he says something like Ultra Vase and then Griffin's like, ooh, don't do that. And unfortunately, nobody else at my table said, hey, Jackson, maybe don't do that voice. So this lasted a few sessions until I was like, actually, I should not do this character. I'm going to completely change it up. Uh, moral of the story, other than, you know, don't be racist in D&D, &D, is maybe don't play your first character uh, that you make in session zero, the the same session that you're doing the session zero. Like, allow that gap time for people to think about the character that they're about to play before they make it set in stone. And that way you might avoid a mistake. Like, yeah, I can do an Antonio Banderas voice. Why not? Uh, let's talk about the second character that Eugene made. Uh, this guy, let's call the elf like Thrakmore, and he was a bow druid. Eugene went to me and he was like, I want to have like a wooden crossbow on my arm that's like 
repeating automatic like i want to be about this bow on my arm more than like nature stuff and i'm like sure fine whatever i'm a new dm and we can do homebrew what's balance uh so i allow this to happen we're having a, a little like off session where he can just test out this character before we get into anything big there is a hobo uprising uh because i'm awful first time gm and think that's a good idea. And and one of the hobos is riding on a snapping turtle with five foot move speed. And I remember Eugene, you know, stopped shooting with his bow because he's like, I can't break through the shell. Better turn into a panther. And he's turning into a panther and he lunges forward at the snapping turtle and immediately gets bitten for massive damage. Pathfinder's druids are much more squishy. He immediately dies. And I say, time to make a third character. Yikes, um, this one is a lot of Eugene's mistake, but honestly, moral of the story for DMs here is to try to, like, at least a little bit guide your players away from death, because having to make yet another character and spend, like, two to three hours on the Pathfinder SRD to make this really cool idea that you then never get to use because you die the first test session, kind of lame. Maybe try to help your little Eugene. Please. So let's go to my my professional career. Sadly, this is a story that happened while I was on the clock and people were paying me. Um, the fifth edition D&D scenario that I made is one that I had ran before. Uh, basically, everybody is stuck in a tower. There's a mystery to solve. There are as a slot incursion and there's a whole lot of phase. So there's a lot of trickery and a lot of characters to figure out. Uh, you know, all while having this political ballroom kind of thing. And we had a new guy that came in and he introduced his character. I'm like, okay, tell us some personality traits. And she's like, and he's like, well, my elf girl is beautiful and she's beautiful. So like red flag there. But I had this scenario that I had already run before where as they're going through and getting clues, one of the people they talk to is a horny satyr playing strip poker and they can go play. And I'm, I defend my any DM's use of a satyr being horny. That's this just true to classic myth. Um, but anyway, this happens there. I'm really saying like, hey, here's a fun little scenario. Ooh, Game of Thrones. They're like, I want to completely play out this strip poker, please. And I'm like, ooh, stop doing that. Uh, they do not stop doing that. They eventually time, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, slod things happen from sleeping with the strip poker satyr who is a slod in disguise. And they have to go to the fairy hospital uh, to which I start to say, okay, this is a suspicious situation because they do start strapping your elf down on the bed. And this guy is like, ooh, do they take off my clothes? And I'm like, please stop. And everyone is like, please stop. Huh. Moral of the story, it you know, we have Witcher and Game of Thrones and, and Critical Role that are all very horny fantasy. I think it's okay to have a little bit of that in your D D game but when you say hey here is a line that i'm highlighting it also say please do not cross this line meet us at this line but do not go over with your beautiful beautiful elf babe who you just want to get naked good lord and now it's time to tell you about eugene's third character. He really came into his own with this character. His name was Nyak. He was a cat folk gunslinger, so cat with a gun, very piratey, very cool. He ran him a few sessions, and then one day Eugene had to not be present, and I offered him, you know, do you do you want to say Nyak, you know, stays with the ship? And he's like, no, Nyak is unconscious, but I trust the captain to guide me through this ice dungeon. They go in the ice dungeon. I have a trap that separates them up based on alignment. Weird, but it worked. Uh, and anyway, it's just the captain and carrying along Nyak, uh, and they're in the final room of the chamber, and the captain is like, all right, I found the chest. It's got the treasure in it. I pick the lock. I undo the trap. I open it. Surprise, there's another trap. It's a huge blizzard. He starts taking cold damage, cold damage, cold damage every round, and he looks around, and he's like, how can I stay warm? And then he sees this cat folk. So next session, we tell Eugene, um, sir, the captain used you as a tauntaun, you are dead. Please make a fourth character. 
I feel like this one is the least my fault because I gave the player the option to sit it out and another player made the choice to cut him open. <laughs> From then on, I have never left an absent player's character in mortal danger like that. I have always said, no, they will they will take a back seat. If anything bad happens, they will wait outside the dungeon. That's that is enough uh yikes stories for the day. Uh please tell me in the comments what my most cringe video is, <laughs> what uh my your worst moment is as a DM. Come your story will probably not be as bad as mine and we can both laugh about it like I hope you did here. And uh have a natural one day. Have just a terrible terrible day. Goodbye.